Usually when I come to talk about the pursuit of happiness, I'm coming to talk about why it goes wrong and how we can do it better. Today what I'd like to do is instead talk about one of its consequences. Now the story starts uh, with Dostoevsky, and it's said that Dostoevsky one day was being annoyed by a pesky child who was asking too many questions, and so he instructed the youngster to uh, leave and not return until he had spent 10 consecutive minutes not thinking about a white bear. As you can imagine, not thinking about a white bear is an extremely difficult thing to do, and this keeps annoying children from coming back. It appears that in the near future, annoying children are going to find this task much, much easier, because even under moderate projections, the shrinking summer ice in the Arctic is going to wipe out two-thirds of the world's polar bears and 100% of the American polar bears in the next 40 years. William James, the great philosopher and psychologist, said, a new idea is first condemned as ridiculous, then dismissed as trivial until finally it becomes what everybody knows. This is exactly what's happened with the conversation on global warming. Critics began by telling us there's no evidence of global warming, and then they said, well, yes, there, it is getting warmer, but there's no evidence that it's due to human activity, and then, yes, it is getting warmer and it's due to human activity, but the consequences will be trivial. Today, Ozone Man is a Nobel laureate, and even the most anti-scientific world leaders seem to admit that we are in trouble. If George Bush knows something, then believe me, everybody else knows it too. <laughs> the question's why. Not why is the planet getting warmer, the question is why, if everybody knows this, are we twiddling our collective thumbs? Now, last year, the nice folks at Starbucks gave me the opportunity to say a few words to several million Americans who were especially suggestible because they hadn't yet been fully caffeinated. And I decided to say these. The human brain is the only object in the known universe that can predict its own future and tell its own fortune. The fact that we can make disastrous, the fact that we can make decisions even as we foresee their disastrous consequences is the great unsolved mystery of human behavior. When you hold your fate in your hand, why would you ever make a fist? Why indeed? It can't be that we just don't care about the future. We all behave prudently in many domains of life. We save for retirement, well, for the most part. We stick to sensible diets, well, for the most part. We remain relatively monogamous, well, at least for the most part. We floss our teeth. In order to save our teeth, we won't change a light bulb to save our planet. The human brain is enormously responsive to threats. I mean, we respond to the threat of cancer by quitting smoking. We respond to the threat of recession by moving money out of stocks. We respond to the threat of terrorism by stocking up on duct tape. So why do we respond to the threat of global warming by shrugging? The answer is that global warming is unlike any other threat. And it is a threat that our brains are uniquely unsuited to do a damn thing about. Our brains were evolved over millennia to notice and respond to things that threaten our well-being. They do this remarkably well. The sight of a tiger, the sound of a gunshot, the smell of fire would empty this theater in a minute. We're a small, slow, fragile primate, but we dominate every other species on this planet because our brains can detect and deflect threat with astonishing speed. But the threats that millions of years of evolution have designed us to detect and deflect have four features. When they have these four features, when any threat has these four features, we respond to it decisively and instantly. But when it lacks these four features, we twiddle our thumbs. Global warming is that kind of threat, a threat that lacks the four features that trigger our cerebral alarms. What are these four features? Well, the first feature that global warming lacks is a face. We are highly social mammals whose brains are highly specialized 
for thinking about other people. You know, I'm sure, that the brain only devotes specific pieces of its precious real estate to particular tasks when those tasks are wildly important. So vision has a particular place in the brain. Language has a particular place in the brain. Shopping does not have a particular place in the brain. We now know that the brain has special neural networks that are specifically devoted to processing information about other human beings what they look like, what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and how they may affect us. Indeed, some scientists have actually claimed that it's the need to think about other people that drove the dramatic increase in the size of our brains in the last few million years. So understanding what other people are up to, what they're planning, what they know, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, has been so crucial to the survival of our species that our brain has developed an obsession with anything that's human. Our brains are hypervigilant. They're on constant lookout for any sign of human agency, which is why we see faces in the clouds, but not clouds in faces. We instantly see this pattern of moving dots as an adult human male walking towards us when it's just some dots moving around on a screen. We never, ever mistake a real adult human male for a series of dots. Our obsession with intentional actions explains why we worry so much about anthrax, which has an annual death rate in the United States of roughly zero, rather than influenza, which has an annual death rate in the United States of roughly a quarter to a half million people. Influenza is a natural accident, but an envelope full of anthrax is an intentional action. And the smallest, least significant intentional action captures our attention in the way that the largest accident simply doesn't. If this plane had been struck by lightning and therefore destroyed the World Trade Center, nobody in this room would even remember the year in which it happened. Global warming is not trying to kill us, and that's a shame. Because if climate change were some sort of nefarious plot visited upon us by very, very bad men with mustaches, then I guarantee you our president would have us fighting a war on warming with or without congressional approval. <laughs> the second reason why global warming doesn't put our brains on orange alert is that it doesn't violate our moral sensibilities. It doesn't cause our blood to boil, at least not figuratively, because it doesn't confront us with things we find indecent, impious, repulsive, and disgusting. Now, I'm not saying that global warming isn't a moral issue. What I'm saying is that visceral emotions are aroused by things with which our brains have for millions of years been deeply concerned. Those things include food and sex, but they do not include atmospheric chemistry. And that's why every human society has elaborate rules about what we can eat and who we can sleep with and none whatsoever about when we can use our air conditioning. Our brains respond to violations of these ancient rules by generating feelings of revulsion and disgust. And these feelings are what compel us to action. Yes, global warming is bad, and sometimes we worry about it. But it doesn't make us feel nauseous or disgraced or dishonored. And that's why we can't get all worked up about it as we do about other major threats to our existence, like, say, flag burning. The fact is that climate change, if it were caused by gay sex or caused by the practice of eating puppies, millions of Americans would right now be massing in the street, insisting that the administration do something about it. The third reason why global warming doesn't seem to trigger our alarm is that we see it as a threat to our future, but not to our present. Like every other animal on this planet, we are very quick to respond to clear and present danger. That's why it takes you just milliseconds to duck when somebody throws a baseball at your head because your brain is an exquisitely engineered get out of the way machine and it's constantly scanning the environment for things out of whose way it should right now get. <laughs> That's pretty much what brains did on this planet for hundreds of millions of years. And then, just a few million years ago, the mammalian brain learned a brand new trick. It learned to predict the occurrence of threats long before they actually happened. Our ability to look deeply into the future and take action against threats that haven't yet materialized is one of the brain's most stunning innovations. That's why I wrote an entire book on it. It's the reason we have dental floss and 401k plans. But this particular ability is, evolutionarily speaking, 
still in the early phases of R&D. Very small part of our brain is responsible for thinking about the future, and a very large part of our brain is responsible for ducking baseballs. This much for thinking about all of eternity, this much for thinking about now. It's not hard to understand why this brain has trouble responding to threats that loom in an unseen future. Why are we so concerned about the moment, so unconcerned about all the time thereafter, even though it's time in which we ourselves are going to live? We haven't quite gotten the knack of treating the future like the present because we've only been practicing for a couple of million years. There's a fourth and final reason why we just can't seem to get really worked up about global warming. The human brain is exquisitely sensitive to changes in light, sound, temperature, pressure, size, weight, just about every other property that a stimulus can have. But as psychophysicists taught us over a century ago, the brain is sensitive to relative changes and not absolute changes. That's why you can see a candle being lit in a dark room, but you can't see three candles being lit in a bright room. Now this simple fact about our sensitivity to relative rather than absolute changes in stimuli also means that the, when the rate of change of a stimulus is slow enough, that change goes undetected. This picture, for example, of a farmhouse is changing before you even as I speak. But the vast majority of you are seeing no change at all. Nothing whatsoever for you is happening in this lovely picture until I point out that you should look at the bottom right corner and watch as I rewind the film. Because as you are watching this film and as you're seeing it now, the ground is disappearing and changing. But because the rate of change in this little 10 second film is slow enough, your eye doesn't see it unless you're specifically directed to it. Because we barely notice changes that happen gradually, we accept changes that we would not accept if they happen suddenly. So the impurity of our air, our water, our food has increased dramatically in every one of our lifetimes, and the only reason we tolerate it is because it happened one day at a time. One day at a time, we've transformed our world into an ecological nightmare that our grandparents would never have tolerated, but that for most of us is simply business as usual because each day isn't dramatically different than the one before. Warnings like these, not to swim in polluted water, not to eat fish, warnings telling you not to go outside on certain days of the year, this was the stuff of science fiction in the 1940s. Today, it's part and parcel of modern life. Scientists lament the fact that global warming is happening so fast. The fact is, it's not happening nearly fast enough. We are the progeny of people for whom the greatest threat was a man with a stick. We are perfectly designed, beautifully engineered by evolution to respond to threats that are painful, that is, to evil people who suddenly threaten our immediate well-being. And When we're confronted with threats like this, we respond with crushing force, firm resolve, exactly as our ancestors would have. Terrorism is a threat that pushes every one of the brain's buttons. That's why we willingly relinquish our civil rights in order to keep the barbarians on the other side of the gate. But global warming is a threat that pushes none of our buttons, and that's why we won't relinquish our hummers for the sake of the polar bears. Global warming is, by its very nature, a threat, but it is a deadly threat only because it fails to trigger the brain's alarm. It leaves us sleeping in a burning bed. It remains to be seen whether we can learn to rouse ourselves to battle an impersonal, slow, and quiet enemy that is indeed more dangerous than any our ancestors ever imagined. Thank you. <laughs>